Deuteronomy chapter 5 and, and 6. I want to talk to you about the, the tri-unity of God. We, we often use the word trinity. <clears throat> As we were singing that, that song this morning, holy, 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 you know, what a mighty God we serve. What a great God. And uh, we, uh, uh, I think sometimes we, we forget how mighty and how holy and how, how wonderful he is. Uh, with uh, Christmas just, just passed, uh, we looked at Matthew 1.23 when it talks about Jesus being Emmanuel, uh, being translated God with us, you know, that God became a man. What a, an amazing thing. Uh, we looked as well at John 1 where the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Uh, you know, we, we believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. But, uh, you know, we believe in the deity of God the Father. <laughs> we believe that uh, Jesus is God the Son, and we believe that the Holy Spirit is God the Holy Spirit. But, you know, we don't believe in three gods. Some people, when they, they see uh, this this teaching, they say, oh, we, you know, we can't believe that. Uh, we, we don't believe, we only believe in one God. Well, we only believe in one God. But he has three persons. God is one, and yet consists of, of three persons. I don't know if you know the history of the book of Deuteronomy, but Israel had left Egypt, and then they sinned, and God had them wander around for 40 years until that generation died. And in Deuteronomy, they're ready to go, go into the land. And it, it means, I, I think, the second law. And uh, Moses is preaching a series of sermons to the nation, uh, reminding them of who they are and what they believe. In, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, one of the things I noticed, <clears throat> Deuteronomy 5, uh, verse 1, he says, Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep and do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. Now, I don't know if I'm interpreting this right, but the thing I got from the, those verses is we need to have a personal relationship with God. It's not enough that our fathers knew him, or our grandfathers, or our ancestors. You need to know the Lord. You need to have a personal, living relationship with the God of the universe. And uh, he, he's saying to them, uh, this isn't just history. Uh, someone has said, God has no grandchildren. <laughs> and it's true. God only has children. You need to be a child of God. And uh, this is the chapter where he repeats the commandments. He reminds them. God has, has given these commandments. But look at verse 29 there in chapter 5. I believe this is what God wants from us. He says, Oh, that there was such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, and that it might be well with them and with their children forever. You know, God wants good for us. God wants it to be well with us. But you know, that's not going to happen if we won't listen to it. We need to have a personal, present tense, tense relationship with God. Uh, we need to recognize who He is. You can't worship God if you won't uh, honor who He is. And we have to submit to Him, His way, His word. That's what He talks about there in, in chapter 5 and, and verse 1. Let's read in, in Deuteronomy 6. This is our main text this morning. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. He says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land whither you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. 
Those are well-known well verses, I would, I would think. Often quoted, uh, repeated in the New Testament uh, many times. You know, the Bible says that we are made in the image of God. Do, do you realize that no other part of creation has that testimony? Uh, not the animals, not the trees, uh, not the chair you're sitting on. <laughs> Nothing else is made in the image of God. Only humans. We're made in the image of God. God is three in one. We are three in one. Now, I know people get pretty attached to their animals, but uh, let me tell you, your animal does not have to get saved, and it can't be lost or go to hell. I'm sorry. Um, the Bible talks about spirit, soul, and body. We, all, we usually say body, soul, and spirit, but God puts it the other way. Um, usually the soul is considered our mind, will, and emotions. Our spirit is our relationship to God. And only man is made in the image of God. God is a three-part being, as are we. Uh, there's no tree or animal uh, that has a spirit. And I know uh, some religions talk about the spirit of a tree or the, having the spirit of an animal. Listen, uh, that's heathenism. That is not based on the Bible or God's word. And we need to be careful what we believe. God made us to know him. And in that text, in, in chapter 6, verse 4, there are two words that show the triunity of God. Interestingly enough, one of them is the word one. <laughs> the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, I, I'm not a Hebrew expert. If, if somebody said something to me in Hebrew, I wouldn't know what they'd said. But I can read and, and I, can, I can study. And uh, that word one there in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 is the word ikad in Hebrew. And it's a word that particularly means several things in unity. For instance, in Genesis 1, 5, when it talks about the first day, he talks about how it was light and dark, morning and evening. It had parts to it. And he used that word, ikad. Uh, in Genesis 2, 24, he talked about Adam and Eve being one flesh. We understand that. That's two people. But they're one flesh. Ecad. Uh, in Numbers 13, 23, they use the word to refer to a cluster of grapes. It's one cluster, many parts. In Ezra 2, 64, he talks about the whole congregation. One, same word, Ecad. One congregation, but many people. You need to realize God could have used a different word in Deuteronomy here that signifies absolute oneness. Uh, there's a, uh, a word in Hebrew called yakid. It means absolute oneness, not, not a combination of anything. God had two words to choose from to communicate the truth of his nature. And he clearly selected the word which identifies him as a plurality. And I'm told that in the Hebrew, plurality is not even just dual. It's not just two. It has to be three or more. Uh, the Lord our God is one Lord. And God chose that particular word uh, to show us this. Secondly, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, the word God, the Lord our God, is one Lord. Uh, is the word Elohim in Hebrew. Now, Elohim has a singular version. Uh, Elohim is the plural, meaning the all-powerful, almighty one. El is the singular of that word. Uh, in the creation account, God refers to himself as Elohim. Plural. We'll, we'll read some verses in just a moment. He could have used El. He chose Elohim. It's because that's who he is. God is the great three in one. Moses uses Elohim 500 times in the books of Moses. Uh, we call the first five books the books of Moses because we believe he wrote them. Uh, the Pentateuch uh, and so on. In uh, Genesis chapter 1, he uses uh, that word uh, we, we see the plurality of God, Genesis 1, verse 26. Oftentimes when people first read this, they get a real puzzled uh, uh, expression. Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He uses plural words, but you know that word image is singular. God said, let us make man in our image. He uses a, uh, the, the word Elohim. In Genesis but with the verse 27 as well. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. 
Male and female created he them. Well, there's a lot of uh, doctrine and truth just in that verse that people are ignoring today. God created us in his image, and God is a plural, singular being. <laughs> That's an amazing thing. Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. I'll just give you a couple. We won't look at too many, but uh, Genesis 3, 22. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and, and so on. The, the Lord God, uh, that's Jehovah uh, Elohim. And he says, us is the Lord God. Genesis 11 and verses 7 and 8. Go to, let us go down and there confound their languages, that they may not understand one another, another's speech. So the Lord scattered them. One God and yet three in one. It, we believe in God the Father. We believe he is, he is God. He's the creator. Uh, I mentioned that word Lord God is Jehovah Elohim. Uh, in Deuteronomy 6.4, you know, we, we hear these words often. The Lord our God is one Lord. We believe that. Deuteron uh, Psalm 46.10, he says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Isaiah wrote in chapter 45, verse 22, Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there's none like me. We believe in God the Father. I hope you do this morning. We also believe in God the Son. We believe that when Jesus came, he was Emmanuel, God with us. I mentioned earlier John 1. In, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Jesus didn't come into existence at Bethlehem. He's always been God the Son, right from eternity. In John 8, there's an interesting exchange that Jesus has, John 8, verse 56. You can imagine if somebody said this to you, what you might think. John 8, verse 56, he's speaking to the Jewish people there, and he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Abraham's been gone a long time at that point. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now that may not mean a lot to you, but they knew exactly what he was saying. He was saying, I'm God. And the next verse says, Then that took they up stones to cast at him. Uh, they didn't believe him. Uh, they thought he was blaspheming. But he proved that that's exactly the truth. Now, we believe in God the Father. We also believe in God the Son. God in, in human flesh. We also believe in God the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is not just uh, an impersonal nothing. The Holy Spirit is part of the triunity of, of God. Now, I, I often use that word triunity rather than the word trinity. I don't guess it makes any difference, but uh, uh, three in one. You know, when uh, Jesus was born, or before Jesus was born, the angel said to Mary, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. He calls the Holy Spirit God. We believe that the Holy Spirit is, is God. We see the triunity of God over and over in Scripture. When Jesus came to his baptism, in Matthew chapter 3, you see the, the Trinity, the triunity. Matthew 3, 16, Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. You see the Son, the Spirit, the Father. At the Great Commission, when Jesus gave that in Matthew chapter 28 and other places, you see the triunity of God. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, there's something you need to notice there. Name is singular. We baptize in the name. One God, yet Father, Son, and and Holy Ghost. You see the triunity of, of the Lord in the resurrection. You know, it's an amazing thing. Jesus in John chapter 2 and verse 19, 
makes a statement that the people didn't really understand at the time. John 2.19, he said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, they thought he was talking about the physical building there. But the Bible says in verse 21, But he spake of the temple of his body. Now, what's he saying? He's going to die, but he's going to raise himself from the dead. I will raise it up. But you know, in uh, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20, the Bible says that God the Father raised Jesus. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, Where am I? through the, oh, I've already read it. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, I'm, I'm looking for it and I'm already past it. God brought Jesus from the dead, God the Father. And in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, it says that the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Made alive by the Spirit. So each one of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is responsible for raising Jesus from the dead. The only way that can be true is if they're one. And that's, a, that's an amazing thing. Now, you need to ask yourself this question. Why is this important? <laughs> well, number one, because it's who God is. We need to know God as he is. You know, there's those who try to distort that and, and say different things about the Holy Spirit and about Jesus and e even about God himself. But it's also important because it's how we know God. See, God made us in his image. And we can have a relationship with him because we're in his image. We don't want to have a relationship with God like a tree has a relationship with God. We don't want to have a relationship with God like an animal has a relationship with God. We want to have a relationship with God like God intends. You know, for the, for the Christian, it's how we relate to him. If you know Christ is your Savior, you can imagine not having the Holy Spirit to help you. Being able to come through Jesus. Being able to have a Heavenly Father that that knows you and loves you. In John chapter 14 and verse 18, Jesus talks about the comforter. John 14, he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I'll come to you. Isn't it interesting? He says, I'll come to you. But later on, verse 26, he says, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. So they, again, you see the Trinity, the Father, the Holy Ghost, Jesus, the Comforter. In uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, he tells us, let me get there first. Speaking of the, of the Holy Spirit, he says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. See, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, the Bible says you're not a Christian. Christians have the Holy Spirit. You know, people try and make, uh, they try and, and, and split God apart and say you can get saved, you can receive God and not have the Holy Spirit. That doesn't make sense. God is one. One God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and, and verse 16, he makes this simple statement. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If you're saved, you're the temple of the Lord. Your body is, is his temple. The Holy Spirit indwells you. And you know, the Lord Jesus has given us the promise uh, in the Great Commission. He said, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Uh, we have the Lord Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit. And in, in 2 John 9, he says, He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Uh, we have the Lord when we get saved. Uh, we come to God the Father through Jesus, we're moved by the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's how we know God, is as He is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We relate uh, to the triunity of God. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, it says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. We need every... Every part of that. 
the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Ghost. Uh, it's how we know him as, as Christians. We relate to that uh, triunity. Uh, th there's a verse in uh, Thessalonians. I meant to, to read it earlier and, and forgot. Um, where he says, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That's completely. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're a three-part being. God is a three-part being. That's how God relates to us. But you know, it's, it's also important in salvation, the triunity of God. Uh, I guess I'm saying this verse several times today, but in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Down that chapter in John chapter 1, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And what a blessing. God sent his Son that we might know him. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible says there in, in John chapter 1 that he came unto his own and his own received him not. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Yeah, that's our God. God the Son. And you know, he's, he's talking there about you knowing God. Have you received God? The Word was made flesh. The Word was God. You know, a lot of people talk about Jesus, talk about this and that. Uh, but uh, we need to know God as he, as he truly is. The key, I think, is this. Only God, by his death, could pay for our sins. It, you know, God is not able to die. So God had to become a man in order to die for our sins. And not only that, but you know, in life, we receive increasing punishment as we sin against beings of increasing value. Now, let me explain that. If you kill an ant, nobody is going to fine you or sue you or put you in prison, hopefully. <laughs> Mosquito, they'll, they'll applaud, you know. But if you kill their dog, you're going to be in trouble. Why? Because there's more value. If you kill a racehorse, I can almost guarantee you, you'll spend time in prison. Why? Because there's increasing value. If you kill a person, at least in times past, that was pretty serious because we're made in the image of God. And you know, you take someone's life, there's, there's nothing that can repay it. That's why God has the death penalty, by the way. It's a fair payment. If you murder someone, the payment is your life. But anyway, that's another subject. In life, we receive increasing punishment as we sin against beings of increasing value. Now, the point is this. When you sin against God, it deserves infinite punishment. God is an infinite being. He's much more important than an ant or a dog or a racehorse or you and me. And when we sin against an infinite being, we deserve infinite punishment. Now, there's only two solutions. A finite being, me, can suffer infinite punishment. You. If you take the punishment for your sin against God, you'll be in hell forever. It's infinite punishment. Or the, the other solution is an infinite being can suffer finite punishment. That's what Christianity is all about. Christ, the God in the flesh, God himself became a man, that infinite being, to die for our sins so that he could offer us forgiveness and, and salvation. I mean, there's so many verses that, uh, that talk about this. For instance, second, uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 24 who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. See, that's why Jesus came. I mentioned several verses from John 1. In John 1, 29, when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Jesus came to be our sacrificial lamb. He's done his part. That infinite being 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They work salvation's plan. Our part is, number one, to agree with him. <laughs> you know, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It says the wages of sin is death. Listen, there's none of us that are innocent before God. We've all sinned. We're born with a sinful nature, the Bible says. I, I didn't have to teach any of my kids how to sin. They, they worked that out themselves. Because that's the way we are. We need to agree with God on that. Secondly, we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What a blessing. That infinite being, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, made salvation possible. An infinite being suffered finite punishment. In, in Romans chapter 10, he gives us very clear words as to how to be saved. If, you, if you're not sure about your eternal salvation, listen, uh, you need to get into God's word and believe what he says. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And later on he says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We need to agree with God. We need to believe who he is and, and what he says. And, and the Bible says then we need to, to call upon him. And he promises, he promises salvation, forgiveness. What a blessing. You know, it's the Holy Spirit who convicts us and calls us. I've had people say, yeah, I liked your message, except that thing at the end. That's the invitation. You know? Oh, boy, that, that, that bothered him. <laughs> well, listen, what kind of a person would I be if, if I say you need to be saved, you ought to be saved, and then I don't give you the opportunity to be saved? I mean, what, that would be awful, wouldn't it? And the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, and, and that's awful <laughs> because we are awful. You know, our, our sin is terrible. And, and as the Holy Spirit brings up our sin, we think, oh, I don't like this preacher. I don't like this church. I don't like this Bible. But it's not them that's the problem. They're just a mirror showing us ourselves. And the Holy Spirit brings those things up and says, you need to trust Jesus. You need to trust Jesus. And you can. God will help you. And Jesus is, the Bible says, is the only way to God. There's no religion. There's no ceremony you can do. There's no drug you can take that will give you this experience. Only Jesus. The great three in one. You can know the God of the universe. He made you to know him. That's why you're here. This morning, let me encourage you. If, you. if you're not sure of your salvation, make sure today. He said, these are written that you may know that you have eternal life. It's by faith in, in God. And faith comes by hearing God's word. If you know Christ as your Savior, listen, glory in, this is such a basic truth, isn't it? But we glory in this. Our great God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, each one a part of our life. And we're made in His image. What a blessing that we can know Him and we can share that with others. You know, the gospel is good news. We need to remember that for ourselves and we need to share it with others. Now, this morning we're going to take our songbooks and go to page 167. It's the song, Just As I Am, Without One Plea, But That Thy Blood Was Shed For Me. Page 167. If you, uh, 